Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 23rd, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I promise you, you're going to believe me, we've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to go get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this free endorsement, but hey, PepsiCo, give me a shout out. Like I said before, Red Bull said I was too fat, so... Um, Forget you, Red Bull. All right, as a disclaimer screen, let me just show you the short version. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay, what we talk about? Well, there's a Chinese bull market, and I don't want to spend too much time telling you what I'm going to talk about. I'd rather just talk about it, but there's a Chinese bull market. There's also a bull market still here at home, and it's in energies especially, and it's still in IPOs with some caveats, and I'll just touch upon that briefly as I've been talking about last few weeks. Um, what else? I think that's good enough. Let's just hop into the charts. Okay, the question is, is it too late to get into the Chinese bull market? Well, let's take a look at this. Here's um, ASHR, which is the China... Um, oops, my pen just pulled out. One second. Talk amongst yourselves. Sorry about that. Okay, this is um, ASHR, and you could pick whatever free, favorite uh, tracking stock you want. I just happened to notice that this one was uh, hitting some serious new highs yesterday. It's pulled back a little bit um, this morning, but not much. But as you can see, so far, pretty serious uptrend remains intact there. So the question is, is it too late to buy at this juncture? Well, it sure does seem extend extended, and sooner or later it will correct. And that correction might turn out to be something much bigger, but keep in mind, or always keep in mind, that trends go a lot further and last a lot longer than most people are willing to believe. And when a market goes into bubble mode, when it goes parabolic, that is especially true. And what happens is it attracts a whole bunch of eager shorts and top pickers, and a lot of times, if the trend continues, these people get squeezed out and it goes even higher. So my answer is, no, I don't think it's too late, even though it looks like it's looks like you missed the boat. Now, here's the thing. I would recommend, if you're going to go into China stocks, go into China stocks that are at low levels and are just beginning to rally off of those lows. And we'll take a look at uh, JMEI if we get a chance in a little while, and that's one that we're actually long. But you can see this one, we just got long this one a couple days ago. And it made a nice little kind of a cup and handle pattern. It also is somewhat of a bow and tie, a, a bow and tie, a bow tie, and it also has a nice little thrust from the lows higher. And you can see it's breaking out nicely above this low level base here. So I'm not a huge fan of base breakouts, but when they occur at low levels and you have a cup and handle or multiple bottoms or some sort of classical technical analysis type of pattern, then the setup that occurs within that bigger picture classical technical analysis. So this type of pattern can be very powerful. So I think this one has uh, potential. Full full disclosure, we are long this stock into portfolio. But the reason I brought this one up is, it, it, depending on how much time we have when we get to the charts, I want to show you a few more of these that are at low levels, and I think that might be worth a shot. So go for the ones at this juncture that have kind of bottomed out, and they're beginning to rise. Now, some people might argue, well, Dave, isn't that when pigs fly? And to some extent, yes. It, the for those of you who are a little bit newer to trading, well, when pigs fly is when you have a bull market and these second tier or lower level stocks begin to rally. But so what? You don't know if these stocks will go up for a day, a month, or even a year and maybe double and triple in value. And if they don't, so what? You get stopped out, nothing ventured, nothing gained. As I often preach, we get paid to put money into harm's way. So keep an eye on those second uh, tier China stocks. I'm going to flesh that out in a little more detail. In fact, if you guys want a list of the China stocks that I'm going to be going through uh, in a few minutes, just let me know, and I'll be happy to give you those uh, stocks. Okay. Um, the next China? Well, I don't know if it's going to be the next China, because China is just absolutely on fire. But I have to tell you, these Latin American stocks look pretty good. And the ETF in and of itself, one of the ETFs, I should say, is EWZ. Now, I'm not a huge fan of trading ETFs. If you know me, I'm not um, that excited about an ETF simply because they're more efficient 
than individual issues. And we'll take, we'll take a look at like JMI, JMI in just one second. But to go back to like that SOL, that stock to me looks like it has the potential to at least double in value. Now, of course, you might get stopped out first. It's always a chance that you might get stopped out, but it sure looks fantastic. Very hard for an ETF to double over a short period of time due to efficiency. Now, there's not enough time to get into it today because we have a lot to cover, but just trust me on that. The, the diversification, or some people call it diversification within an ETF, makes it a little bit harder for it to make those big inefficient moves. But this one looks pretty good, and ETFs can be wonderful to gain exposure to a sector. For instance, right now, we're along USO because it's set up. It looked good to us, so we took the setup, and the reason we took it was to gain some exposure to the energy sector while we found, or while we look for, I should say, more inefficient type of issues to trade. So here's the EWZ, which is uh, actually Brazil. It's, it's not up here, but let me just put it up here for you, ZIL. And um, you can see that it's been in a longer-term downtrend. And I don't know how far back this chart goes. You can see it sort of began with a bow tie here. And now you've got a bow tie up. And that just means that the moving averages, it's a 10 simple, a 20 exponential, and a 30 exponential, are coming together. It kind of looks like a bow tie. And I have a YouTube channel uh, for if you want to know a little bit more on this. So imagine a little bow tie and a little, little fella, okay? But nice little thrust off of lows, a nice kind of little pullback in here. And remember, when you're trading these transitional type of patterns, you're looking for that first little tiny pullback. You're not looking for a, a big pullback. Like if we were longer term extended trend, we might be looking for something a little deeper that looks like that. But with an emerging trend, you're looking for that first little tiny pullback, especially when you have a bow tie working. So uh, Brazil, Latin America, these stocks are looking pretty good here. I suppose one of the reasons is that – we. Uh, they're energy related. There's a lot of energies in Latin America, and energy is doing great. So Latin American energy stocks might be a good place to look for opportunities. Also, steel and iron is looking pretty good. When we get to the actual, we get to the live charts, I should say, not actual charts, live charts. I want to bring up steel and iron and show you how we see the bottom there. And I think that Chinese steel stocks that might be a way to go. So you kind of get that uh, double barrel approach with that. So that's probably why the EWZ is doing so well. So take a look at um, these low-level energy stocks. PBR was on my watch list a while back, but it got away from us. Uh, I think it's Petrobras or something, but that's a Latin American type of uh, energy stock. And we'll take a look at as many of these as we can. Now, speaking of energies, right now we have a bull market at home in the energies. At least I think we have a developing bull market. Now, what's exciting about this is these energy stocks have been beaten to hell. Now, I'm not a value player. I would never buy something because it's beaten up. I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. If it's beaten up, there's a chance that it might die, okay, or it could get beaten up even further. So never try to pick a bottom when it comes to markets. But if you see a stock such as the energies that have been beaten up, and they come down here and they begin to bottom out and form like a classical technical analysis pattern, such as like a double bottom. Look at this nice little double bottom here. So that looks pretty good. Now, you wouldn't buy it just because it makes a double bottom, but then look what happened here. Made a nice little bow tie. It rallied nicely off the low. Also, the rally is just a beautiful and very persistent type of rally. Notice I could draw a line through most of the bars. And mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression. But you know me, I like to keep it simple and just draw a line through the bars. And then you can see that it has pulled back in here. It also, to those of you who recognize a little classical technical analysis, nice little cup and handle sort of pattern. So this looks like a big fat bottom, no pun intended, okay? And when you have a bow tie coming off of these major, major lows like this, I think it's about 10-year lows um, or maybe even longer for this one. It might even be all-time lows, at least for the, for the life of this contract. It's usually worth a shot. Your risks are fairly limited. Maybe a stop down here, somewhere to where you would think you'd be wrong. I spent a lot of time on stops over the past uh, several weekend charts, or actually going back a few months, I should say. And one of the things I said was, okay, where would you obviously be wrong? Well, if the market comes down here, 
then it just it looks like it's it might be going back to its old low. So you probably want to get out somewhere right below 26, just in case you're wrong, and let it bottom out again. And then someday, if it makes another uh, bow tie, then you go after it again. It's okay to take a stab at a market and get stopped out because sooner or later, if you're trading bow ties or first thrust or some other emerging trend pattern off of these major, major lows, there's a very good chance that you might catch the mother of all bottoms and double or triple your uh, your investment or at least get a two or 300% move in some of these things. Obviously, there's no guarantee, and when you are trading emerging trends, you've got to realize you're still fighting what could be a longer-term trend. So you could have a longer-term trend. This whole thing could just be a consolidation, and then it makes another downtrend. But when you see a setup, you take it. Kind of reminds me, was it Steve Winward or what was his name? When you see a chance, you take it. And that's kind of how um, I see that. Okay. Now, before we go any further, any questions on the Chinese bull market? We'll come back to the live charts in a few minutes. But any questions on that? Any questions on the energy bull market that I think is beginning to develop or Latin America? Okay. Fantastic. Let's keep going. Um, I left this in from last week. Um, somebody sent me an email saying, hey, Dave, what do you think about this stock? And then my thoughts are is if the stock looks like electrocardiogram, and this is an actual electrocardiogram for my clip art program, this is an actual picture of one, then it's probably not a stock that you should be trading. You want some sort of structure. For instance, let's just go back to this one real quick. And here we have structure. Again, you have a double bottom. Now, you wouldn't trade it just because of that, but then look at how the stock becomes orderly all of a sudden. Notice I could draw a line through all these bars, and then you've got a nice little pullback, okay? Draw some lines on your chart. Get your little paint pen out or screen capture your screen and start drawing lines to get used to recognizing these patterns. And also, do what I do. Look at a lot of chances. I mean, I'm sorry, a lot of chances. Look at a lot of stocks, and that's going to increase your chances of recognizing these patterns. Okay, this is Steve Winward, the arc of a diver. I remember that. When you see a chance, you take it. That's right. I actually had that album, and back then it was an album. Okay, so again, this is uh, somebody emailed me this last week. Now, I don't want to pick. I know we got a lot of new guys in here today, so I'm not picking on you. If you do send me a chart like this, I'm not going to beat you up too bad if you're a new guy, but if you've been following the methodology for a while, and if you consider yourself a trend follower, then trust me, a stock that looks like this is not a trend. Just keep it simple when you're starting out. So if you do want to learn how to pick the best stocks, obviously I do have a course that's available. You get in instant access to that. These are the actual stocks that I picked and what they did over the next few weeks. And what I did was, I showed you how to pick stocks. We went in and we picked them, and then this is what happened. And we picked stocks that look exactly like this. There's nothing that's not disclosed. There were some stocks that bottomed out, made some bow ties, look just like this, and that's why I thought they were worthwhile. There were also uh, some in extended trends that looked pretty darn good and that it pulled back. And there were also, obviously, a couple of IPOs in there. Now, I want to talk about losing to win. Now, you guys see this chart quite a bit. And you guys have been around for a while. Uh, but you do guys in here, I want to show you something. This is a stock we got in a while back. And it began to take off, and we were up about 12%. That's pretty good, 12% in one day. That's better than a poke in the eyes. So that sounds great. And if you are of that very short-term mentality, you might think, well, how often did I get 12% in one day? I better, I better grab that profit and move on. And you would have been right for at least a day in doing that. But the reality is longer term, the real money is in longer term trends. And the only way you're going to get big gains is to be willing to give up some gains. So you were up 12% and then you went back to break even. And then it consolidated, took off again. They were up 25%. So that sounds like a lot. That's a pretty good trade, right? Well, it's better than a poke in the eye. And then I think we did take partial profits here. Okay. But you have to hold on for what should hopefully, or what could hopefully, not should, what could hopefully turn into a longer-term trend. Then you see all these gains evaporate. 
Now, that's tough to watch that happen, but you're never going to make a lot of money in the markets, trend following, if you don't stick with the trend. The real money's in longer term trends. Now, shorter term, we don't know if that trend's going to materialize. Okay? But we know shorter term, if we see a really good looking trend like this accelerating higher, and we see that little knockout move here, we get a little setup, we know that we're probably have a pretty good chance of making a short term profit in here. Now this one took a little time to develop and we didn't get it until here, but still it's better than a poke in the eye. Now what happens is, I don't want to get too far to buddy manager because I spent a lot of time talking about that uh, in the prior webinar. See the YouTubes for that. But in general, just know that we trail a stop higher and then when we get to our initial profit target, we pull it up to break even. And luckily in this particular case, we didn't get stopped out at break even. And then we just keep trailing that stop higher. And then once again, we didn't get stopped out again on the remaining shares. The reason you take this short-term profit and that's one half, is because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Obviously, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's one of the few things that I can tell you with 100% confidence that is true when it comes to the markets. So you can see at this point you're up 44%, so around that higher or whatever, it's almost 50% or, or fairly close to 50%. And then all of a sudden the stock pulls back a little bit. Well, you're still up 25%, but you gave up a significant portion of those gains. Well, what I would suggest you do is don't worry about it. Just let things uh, let things pan out and follow your plan. I was trying to say pan and plan in the same sentence. It's not easy. Let things pan out and follow your plan. And the fact that we didn't get stopped out, what happens? Well, we get a trailer that stop higher again, okay? And we're also allowing the stop to widen out a little bit, okay? So see how wide the stop is here? And then back here, the stop was only about, uh, let's see, it was about this big, okay? So it was this big here, and then now it's about this big. So we're allowing that stop to widen out so we can ride out these longer-term retracements and stick with the trend. Unfortunately, the trend doesn't go just one way. It doesn't always go in your favor every day, but longer-term, that's the way to play. You want to play with the trend. I just got an email from my friend Greg Morris, and, and I like what he calls it. He calls it dancing with the trend, and I think that's a beautiful way of saying things. Um, anyway, you can see that you're up nearly 100% here. Okay, Well, that seems like enough money, right? Well, no. I mean, if you quit at 100%, you'll never make 200%. And then what happens, of course... It comes back down a little bit, and then you're only up about 72%, okay? And then we start trailing that stop higher. And then at this point, you're up 200%. Well, is 200% enough? 211%? Well, in this case, it would have been, okay? In perfect hindsight, it would have been. But if you quit at 200%, you'll never make 400% on a trade. That I can guarantee you. If you quit at 400%, you'll never make 800% on a trade. That I can guarantee you. If you quit at 800%, you'll never make 1,600%. So, you know, it's like, well, Dave, how much? How many times do you make four or 500% of a trade? Not that often. But often enough, even if it is once every two years, even if it's once every five years, it's often enough to stay with that trade. One good trade can make your year. And if you get two or three of them, you could have an amazing year. Now, they don't come around often. It takes a lot of patience, and you have to follow your plan, okay? Now, this one did stop out for about 150% gain somewhere in here. So you gave up some of that trend, but so what, okay? There's not enough time to tell the story today, but it's a pretty interesting, it's a funny story. Uh, no one rings a bell for you when the market has has topped. I'll, I'll tell it. Uh, I can't just tease you like that. I, I, I wrote the call a while back uh, when I was early in my stock trading career, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember Prodigy, and that was long before the Internet came out. But Prodigy was pretty cool because it had uh, it tapped into these forums, and I guess they were they called them bulletin boards back then. And I would uh, spend hours and hours reading bulletin boards about stocks and on. And I was a little naive, and I didn't realize that people just got in there and pumped and dumped or whatever they were doing. 
And one guy was really pumping this medical stock, and it was an older gentleman. And, and uh, literally, it was, a, it, was, it was a pump. It was a medical pump stock, and I forget the exact name of the company. And I bought it, and I bought it, and I bought it. And he would come in and tout it every day, and I bought more, and he touted some more, and I'd buy some more. And we became really friendly, and we actually started talking on the phone, and we talked a lot about the market and, and what was going on in the markets. And, and I just kept buying and buying that stock. So the stock crashed. <laughs> I'm like, WTF? Because every time it dipped before, he would say, oh, it's on sale. It's a bargain. Buy more. And then so it crashes. So I call him up, and he says very calmly, David, no one rings a bell for us when a stock has topped. And it's like, really? Why didn't you tell me that the whole time? Why didn't you tell me that, that you didn't know something that everyone else didn't know? And, and, and so all of a sudden, his tune changed. And that was a very valuable lesson for me. So, But it was a good lesson, okay? Any time you get a lesson you can learn from, it's a good lesson. And I'm going to talk a little bit about experience in just a second here. So I don't want to get you far ahead of myself. But it's okay to give up some of those gains, okay? So you're up 250%. You can stop that at 150-something percent. I forget exactly what it was, but it was 150-plus percent. And that's better than a poke in the eye, okay? If you did that on every trade, you would own the world pretty quickly, okay? Uh, so at half of the initial profit target, now I'm having second thoughts if it was okay. Well, half, half on what stock, Shay? Don't have no. It's a, it's you got to follow your plan, okay? Have a plan in place and follow your plan. And as long as you do that, you're going to do fantastic. Not on every trade, but longer term, you're going to do fantastic. Easier said than done, but it's not nearly hard as hard as most people try to make it. Don't sit there and try to think, ooh, is 100% enough? I don't know. How many times the stock goes 100%? And you start all that, and I can't say what I want to say, but you start all that mental, you know what I'm talking about, where it just you, it kind of goes over and over and over your head. You don't have to do anything but honor your stop. And that's how you stick with winners longer term. So, again, how much is enough? And then this was left over from last week. We were up 90%. And this TRIL. Now, obviously, this type of move straight up like this is not sustainable. But, again, if you quit at 90%, you'll never get to 180. If you quit at 180, you'll never get to 360%, okay? If you quit at 360%, man, that's getting harder now. What's that, 360, <laughs> 360, uh, 720, 720%, okay? And then what, 1440? You get the idea, right? So you can't quit at the 50-yard line. You'll never get a home run or a touchdown. How's that for mixing some metaphors up? Now, what happened with Trill? Unfortunately, it did begin to correct. And that's one thing I can promise you. When a stop begins to take off like this, it's going to correct. Now, corrections are a healthy thing, okay? Provided it don't stop you out, of course. But when a stock corrects, it, it purges out the fast money. It purges out those with little or no staying power, those people who are going to dump their position on top of you and take you out with them. And it also attracts some eager shorts in. Now, I don't know if this stock is shortable, so that might be, that might be the full story on this one. But as a general statement, a correction will attract some eager shorts because it's the top pickers come in. And if the market goes back up, then there's a chance that you keep on going. Now, this is a little bit of an extreme example, and this is exactly why I'm showing it to you, because it is an extreme example. This thing went up to 100% over a fairly short period of time, and now it's having a fairly deep correction, okay? Now, the stop is, um, I'm not going to tell you what the stop is, just so nobody goes gunning it, but, well, I guess I could say, it's not that far away from where we are now. So if we get stopped out, so what? It would be nice to have this, 100% turn into 200% or 400% or 800% or 1600% or 3200% or 6400% or 12,000 whatever percent. But this is what we do. We get paid to take chances, and sometimes you have to give up some of those open profits, okay? And it looks like a pretty big hit, but so what, okay? As we saw in that prior example, if you're not willing to give up some open profits, you'll never make any big money trading. 
Okay, at least trading trends in the way I believe you should trade the market. Now, keep in mind, it's not my way or highway. If you're successful doing what you do, then do what you do. And if you could take a piece of what I do and incorporate it to what you do, then by all means, I would be flattered if you did that. And I do think that I have enough experience to where there are some simple things that can be used to help make any type of trade even better. I'm not saying it to be egotistical, but I reason I'm saying is I've had the luxury of working with some amazing traders out there and money managers, and a lot of the stuff that I preach and teach day in and day out I thought was common knowledge, but I was on a project a while back, and one of the guys, not that a PhD makes you a good trader, but, but he is a good trader in spite of his, his massive intelligence, he said, you know, it was kind of cool the way Dave did that with the taking of the partial profits and widening out the stop. It's like he went in with a short-term risk and a short-term defined risk, and then he let that thing open up, and he ended up doing really well on the remainder of the position. And I just thought that everyone knew how to do that. It's kind of like uh, Pinocchio being a, a bad motivational speaker. I see potential in you and you. And, you know, it's like everybody knows that. Well, evidently, everybody doesn't know that. Anyway, as far as open profits, if you get a chance, and I have it on my website, and if you punch it in my uh, Amazon window, you can get a copy of it, too, and I'll make about 35 cents, and I can throw that in the plate uh, next Sunday. But it's called The Way of the Turtle by Curtis Faith, and I've, it's not a, an earth-shattering book. Uh, I think the turtles hit things right. I think they were in the right place at the right time. And they captured some wonderful trends. And as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, everything works better with trend. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But Curtis Faith wrote that book, and it's a good book. It's, it's, I liked it because it was entertaining. And I remember I was at one of these AAPTA meetings a few years back, and somebody began talking about uh, how in that book they talked about they got a ping pong table. And there was nothing to do. There was no trades to make. They'd play ping pong, and they became virtually – pros or nearly pros at playing ping pong because they didn't do anything unless there was something to do. Now, if you could just get one little takeaway from a book like that, I think it's it's paid for itself a hundred times over. But the other takeaway that I got from it was that Dennis took a, um, a different approach or had felt differently to open profits being lost or losses to open profits as opposed to losses. Now, let's say you had a stop down here, and let's say you could stop that, and you didn't honor your stop, and, and all of a sudden this number is getting bigger and bigger, and you're losing more and more money, then that's a problem. But if you're going to ride out of trends, you're going to have retraces along the way. That I can guarantee you, okay? It's not always going to go straight up. So Dennis didn't have a problem with losing a big hunk of that open money because he knew that's part of the game. But he did have a problem with if you had a lot of losses and if you're picking bad markets and you're not following the systems and creating losses and bigger losses, that's one thing. But losing open profits is a total different thing and could be needs to be put in a complete different category. Okay, the question is, um, got in late, uh, will the recording be sent out? Uh, yeah, I will put them, um, I'll put it up on YouTube and at some point uh, I might actually send out links to that. But if you have, uh, if you're on my newsletter, which you should be from, for signing up for this, I'll put the link in tomorrow's newsletter. So thanks for um, for asking me about that or reminding me about that. So anyway, that's um, open profits. Now we covered this last week in a lot of detail, so I want to kind of just breeze through this real quick and touch upon a few things. Uh, first of all, do not monetize your open profits. That's probably the biggest thing and, and the main thing I should emphasize. Today, a lot of times people get a big open profit and they think, you know, like in my case, I'm, I'm into cars and I'm thinking I could go buy a classic car for that, that amount of money I have open. And you kind of, it kind of messes your, your head up. And uh, because if you start losing some of that open profit, then you're like, oh, no, I can't buy that car and that's going to be a crappy car or whatever the case may be, whatever you may be into. So try not to monetize that profit in your head, mentally monetize it, just see it as open profit and see it as just like little green numbers on the screen. And I had a futures broker when I first got started many years ago. He told me that um, when I went through a drawdown once, he said, you know, just focus on 
making the numbers get bigger and make it a bit of a game. And instead of dealing with these psychological issues, you just sort of make it a game and your life becomes a lot easier. And I have a lot to say about that, and I've talked quite a bit about that in the past. But just try to make it a game. Don't monetize those open profits. Do be willing to give up some open profits. And if a market goes parabolic, guess what? That trend is not sustainable. But trends go a lot further and last a lot longer than people are willing to believe. This stock just went parabolic in here. We knew it wasn't sustainable. But on this day here, we're like, well, you know, it's going parabolic. How long can it sustain this? And then it went up quite a bit more. Okay. Now, I've seen stocks double from just being straight up. In fact, I have a list that I manage, my momentum list, called the Landry 100. And the only way you can get into that list is to make a new high, ideally on an expansion of range. So this stock here would have went into that list. If it did not, I have to check to see if it went in on this particular day here. And I've had some stocks go in that list, and I don't have the longer-term uh, list of stocks in front of me. But when I was doing a presentation, when I was getting the list ready for the presentation that I did at last week's APTA conference, I remember that I was cleaning up the database and taking out the old ones and putting in some new ones. And I remember taking one out that was up 162%. That's 162% from where I put it in. And when I put it in, it was at a brand new high. So that just gives you an example of how far a trend can go. Okay. So the other thing, too, and, and I've yet to come up with a better way of saying this, and I'd like to brainstorm maybe with you guys someday. Uh, you've already taken your partial profits out, so you're playing with the market's money. You reduce your share size, you're not playing with the market's money. No, this should be, this should be you are playing with the market's money, okay? So once, once you take your partial profits, sorry about that slide, we'll get that fixed. Um, once you take your partial profits and you're giving up open profits on the remainder of a position, the worst you can do, of course, is break even, of course, being barring overnight gaps. So you have to look at that position on a net-net basis. So let's get back to this one here, okay, which stopped out somewhere in here at about 150%. So you got in here. Actually, you got in a little bit better than that. You got in here. And then you got stopped out around here. Well, if you measure that from there to there, that's 150%. Don't worry about all the zigs and zags in between, okay? Just look at this line from here to here, okay? And that's a pretty damn good trade. If you could do that on every trade, you should do great. How much do you take at the partial profit? You take half of your shares off, okay? So let's say you're in a trade, if you, you put on 1,000 shares, and let's say you're risking $5, okay, on the trade. Well, when the trade is up $5, when you have plus $5 profit, you would take half those shares off, okay? So you take off 500 shares times $5, okay? And if you look back to, uh, let me just show you something else, too. In the portfolio that I manage, the model portfolio, what we do is we take a 2% risk on every trade. We divide that into two lows. So we're taking 1% risk on the first loaf, 1% risk on the second loaf. And then we figure out how many shares we're going to buy based on that. Now, I would round up or lower with a real account. Okay, this is all hypothetical and for educational purposes only. But on a real account, I would round up or down. So in a case like this, I'd probably go with 600 shares instead of uh, 250, instead of uh, 500 and whatever that is. So you divide that by two. Let's just say 300 shares on the first loaf and 300 shares on the second loaf. So when you hit that 1% gain, which is your risk, okay, which is about $1,000 on a, well, which is $1,000 on a 100K account. This is a hypothetical 100K account. Then you take partial profit. So you're only going to make about 1000 bucks on the first trade unless you get a big gap in your favor. And every now and then we'll get lucky. And I use the word luck, but there's a little skill involved, but it's mostly luck when you get that nice big pop in the first loaf and you make one, more than 1%. But the goal in the second loaf is to make a lot more than 1%. And if you go in and look at the column I wrote uh, on Monday, the actual portfolio is in there, and you could see that some of those stocks 
or up uh, substantially on the second loaf. There's one in particular that I'm thinking of. Let me see if I can uh, pull that up for you real quick just to show you where that is. Okay. I better not. I don't want to have anything um, go up that's not supposed to be up. Okay, so here are some tips and tricks, again, for variety of winners. And the bottom line is, again, let's not spend too much time on here, but the bottom line is never forget that you want to say so long and thanks for all the fish What I like is what I like to say, meaning that you had a good trade, you made a lot of money, then you say so long and thanks for all of the fish, which is a quote from, um, what's his name? Uh, is it Clark? No. What's his name? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Speaking of fish, I'm not going to bore you with the sardine story again this week, but I will tell it again on Tuesday. Um, I'm going to do an IPO webinar on Tuesday, so we'll talk a little bit, a bit about the sardine theory of trading IPOs then. So keep an eye out. I have an announcement tomorrow's newsletter on that. Uh, as I would say quite a bit, the, um, yeah, trading sardines, that's what we're going to do. Uh, the debarkation has really increased. There's still a, a bull market in IPOs, but they're looking like this and they're looking like that. And that's a lot, seeing this a lot more than we were. When I first started uh, publicly talking a lot about IPOs back in 2013, they were, they looked a lot more. You had a lot that looked like this, and you had a few that were in between. And then you had quite a few that looked like this. But the majority of them were going straight up. So it was a super bull market. Now the demarcation has increased. Like I said, they either fly or they die. And the beauty of that is you just totally avoid the ones that are headed lower and you buy the ones that are going up. And I'm going to talk a lot about this in the uh, webinar on Tuesday night. So keep an eye out for that uh, webinar, okay? It's Tuesday the 28th. So, again, if you want to get a jump start on all that, um, there is a webinar I did a while back. If you go to DaveLandry.com slash trade IPOs, in the middle of the page, there is a link to a YouTube webinar on that. And by the way, this is Trill. This is uh, the stock that we just showed uh, a few minutes ago in the background here, which is, again, still in a live portfolio. Douglas Adams. That's what I was thinking about. Douglas Adams, thanks for all the fish. The um, I was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. When the... Um, I think the dolphins were leaving the earth because they knew the earth was going to be blown up. Uh, as they were leaving, they said, so long, and thanks for all the fish. Uh, here's the promo for this week for everybody watching. Uh, if you use the promo code TRIAL, T-R-I-A-L, 40, okay, you'll get uh, 40 bucks off the introductory rate on the trading service. The portfolios and the examples, I would say 99% of the examples that I use and these weekly charts come straight from the portfolio. And it is a very repeatable service. I don't recommend something and you go to get in and it's like I already got in and it's already up 10 points. I recommend something it might take two or three days to trigger so you know going in what the setups are. Okay. And if you do go to some of these things, you could find them in the store. So if you go to Trade IPOs, there's a video there. There's also a video under the stock picking Thing, and it's just DaveLander.com forward slash store. Okay. Um, like I said, I just got back from the AAPTA conference. And as I told my peeps at the service back on Monday, I'm sure that you're going to see a little content from me here and there. Every time I go to one of these meetings, I, I, I get a few things, a few little gems and a few little tidbits, and they, they tend to come out over the next several years. Uh, in these presentations, and one thing is, um, you know, I wish I knew the exact quote he uh, he he said, but I was talking about doing the wrong thing, and people doing the wrong thing, and people cherry picking the uh, setups and missing the big winners and things like that. And we were sitting at lunch, and Larry McMillan said, "Experience is when you remember that this is the same thing you did wrong last time." And I thought that was a brilliant uh, quote. I told him I was going to use him on that. And he, using him on, use, yeah, use that quote. Uh, he's, I, don't think it's, I don't know if it's an original quote to him, but I couldn't find it on the Internet. So if somebody knows the original quote, I'd like to give them um, attribution to that. Okay. 
One thing that I notice, and I'm noticing an error in my slide, is we had a lot of money managers and professionals and people who are with big firms that were speaking and that were at the conference. And, you know, some questions that came up while I was speaking is like, well, how could you give up those open profits? We, we couldn't, our committee wouldn't allow us to do that. And I'm like, well, you got to do the right thing. Okay, he's like, how can we tell a client that we had to give up this profit? Well, you can't mentally monetize that profit. You can't show it to the client. So, like, here's, here's this big profit we have, but we'll probably let a little bit of it evaporate, <laughs> you know. But as a private trader, you could do that, and you could do the right thing, and you could do what price tells you to do. Never forget that the market will tell you what to do. You just have to follow along and do it, okay. Now, as a private trader, you could trade as much or as little as you want, okay? One of the speakers up there, he's developed these models, and he had to change his models because he can't trade too often in his firm. They frown upon that. And he actually said he wished he was running a mutual fund to where he didn't have to report all the trades to the client or to the to the management or whatever, and he could just do what he wanted to do. But he actually traded his models to be a little bit more longer term or whatever the case was because he's kind of handcuffed on the amount of trades he can make. Okay. Uh, somebody else said they had a bunch of cash that they have to put to work. And his point was that nobody gets fired on Wall Street when the market goes down because they invested the cash of the client but people get fired on Wall Street when they sit on cash and stocks are going higher. Okay, even, even if they don't think it's a good time to buy, whatever the methodology may be, if they're sitting on cash and that market is moving favorably, I guess, as the caveat there, a little higher, then they better be invested. Okay, now some guys are cautious right now. And rightfully so. I can't blame them. And they're sitting on a big wad of cash. And they know that if they don't put that money to work, their jobs might be on the line. I don't know if it's necessarily anybody who's at this meeting, but as a general statement, if you're sitting on a lot of cash and the market begins going up or keeps going up, whatever the case may be, you better damn sure put some money into the market. So your hand is kind of forced into that situation of putting that money to work. Now, again, decisions on price are all are the only thing that matters. Uh, tax considerations came up a little bit in the meeting, and, and I don't worry about that. You can't worry about taxes, okay? Let's say you got a bunch of positions on for clients, and, you know, it's like if only you could make it to the end of the year or another two months or whatever the holding period is for the long-term uh, capital gains. I don't know. I've got an accountant for all that stuff. You're thinking, well, let's hold on to this position. Even though we should have gotten out by now, you might be forced to hold on that position to, to, to avoid creating a tax expense. So that's the beauty of being a private trader. And that's one thing that really made me think that, okay, Dave, even though uh, I feel like I probably should be in the money management world again, it's probably good that I'm not in the money management world because now I can look at the charts object objectively, trade my own accounts, do what I think needs to be done, and not have to worry about the scrutiny of public money management. So that's kind of a cool thing. And then obviously there's other problems that come along with this that take you away from the markets, like I'm not going to say who, but uh, anyone, some people there were talking about audits, and sometimes you'll have five or six people come to your, audit, your office and camp out with you and ask for a whole lot of stuff, okay? Now, I don't want to digress too far, but you kind of get the point is that a lot of these things can really take you away from doing the right thing and just watching the charts and letting the market tell you what to do. The other thing, and I kind of went in with this preconceived notion, and I came certainly came out with it once again. Everything works better with trends. So if you've got a methodology, put a trend filter on that methodology, okay? Or scrap the methodology and just trade trend to begin with. Now, with that said, let me just show you something really simple. 
Now, I wouldn't rush out and trade this system because it's going to chop you up a little bit when the market isn't trending. So if the market's doing this, it's not going to work so well. But when the market's trending, it can work quite well. So you can see this last little run that the S&Ps have made, very significant run for an index, okay? Notice that the lows are greater than the moving average for a long, 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 long time. We only had one, two, three, four days here. And then if you even go way back, we only had a couple days, more days here. So it's only a handful or a half a dozen or so days where the lows are less than the moving average, meaning that, I'm sorry, the highs. The high of the bar is less than the moving average. Notice that the lows have been greater than the moving average for a long, long time. So you see, even a little system like this, just trading when the lows are greater than the moving average, can work darn well. Because why? Well, there's a trend. So everything works better than trend. So I call that daylight. Actually, it was um, someone who read the article, a guy by the name of Joe up in the Bronx, read the article that I wrote in 1995 in Stocks and Commodities, where I talked about uh, a, an exponential moving average and then having a little two-bar breakout pattern where the lows were greater than the moving average. It was just a simple trend following system. Uh, it's called 220 EMA Breakout. You can find it on the Internet, um, and, in, and if not, you get it straight from traders for like a dollar. I won't make any money off of that. But uh, Traders, which is a Stocks and Commodities magazine. Anyway, uh, he called it Daylight, and he, and he kind of, uh, the name stuck. So it's Daylight. You can see light in between the low and the moving average. So the point is, everything works better with trend. This is a, just a simple little trend following system. But, of course, it works a lot better when what? The market is trending. Okay, I kind of think I beat the announcements to death. Um, this is the address uh, for the store, and I do have some videos on the uh, store page. Also, if you get a chance, speaking of videos, join my YouTube channel. And if you don't have a chance, do it anyway. Um, and I've got 12, over 1,200 videos there, and it's growing daily. And I'm going to start putting more and more of these shows up. And, and so far, because everybody seems to appreciate it, I've been putting up these wicked charts up there. Uh, any course that I do, there's unlimited follow-up, so that goes for the IPOs too, IPO course too. Uh, keep in mind that the, the, the follow-up or the support is based on the course itself. And I might, have to, I, might, I might beat you up a little bit and say, you, you missed the point here. Go back and rewatch this and pay attention to what's in the course. It's not like, hey, Dave, I want to build a trading system. What do you think? It's like, well, that's a different type of consulting. Okay, and it's something that I probably want to stay out of because I've already got my consulting business and, I, and I've worked for the last 20, 30 years to figure out what should and could be done in the markets. And what I settled upon was swing to intermediate term trend following. Start with a swing trade, stick with it longer term. So anyway, oh, by the way, just a little uh, housekeeping. I do have a little, I did, I did implement, I do video course delivery and service delivery service. Um, recently, in fact, last night I went live with that. So it's a new improved system. It's pretty cool, and I'm pretty excited about that. Um, any questions, anything covered so far before we hop out to the overall markets? Okay. All right, let me get the chart set up here real quick. I'm doing fine. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. That's a that's a vote of confidence. Got a little blank chart there, huh? <laughs> All right. What I want to do real quick. Let's um. Let me show you these China stocks real quick. If you guys want a list of these stocks, I just put this together this morning. Uh, let me know, and I'll export that out. And if a lot of people request them, we'll just uh, I'll just put them on a website somewhere or something. Okay. Um, if you look at these stocks, and let's take a look at um, some of these in here. For instance, remember I said uh, metals and mining are doing pretty good. Well, this is an aluminum stock, but still, you get the idea. Okay, this is Chinese aluminum stock, so it's taken off in here. Um, let's take a look at some of these. Let's take a look at some of these. Well, let's sort them by volume first. Okay. 
And as you go through these, no, not Baba, because it's just, it was a piece of crap to begin with. But anyway, I shouldn't say crap, but anyway, you can see that's, that's, the, that's the proverbial fly and die when it comes to an IPO, okay? They go up, and then what happens, they go back down. But that's okay. You can make a lot of money on the way up. Here's an ETF. As you can see, it's just on a tear in here. Here's another Chinese stock going straight up. Now, here's one that's kind of bottoming out, and this is the kind of pattern that we're looking for in here. In fact, let me show you JMEI. Nope, that's not it. Okay, yeah, we'll get to individual stocks in just one second. Let's just um, let me cover China and let me cover the overall market. We have plenty enough time to get the stocks. This is one where long, you can see you got a little pullback here and you got a nice little cup and handle that happened, a first thrust. And I think the bow tie might be a little sloppy. No, it's good. You got a nice little bow tie here. And even though it's up significantly in here, I still think it has a lot of potential. So on pullbacks along the way. Now, the point is, I think you're better off looking at these China stocks that are at low levels for opportunities as opposed to those that are already at uh, high, high levels. And this one's a little wide and loose, but you can see it kind of made a nice thrust off lows, pulled back a little bit, and it's taken off out of that pattern. So you can see some of these transitional patterns are really kicking in. See, this was going straight up. That's going to be a little bit more dangerous to trade. Not that it might not be worth a trade when it pulls back, but I'd rather find something at lower levels or second tier, as I call them, that's beginning to take off. This is that ETF we looked at earlier. You can see so far, so good. It's just kind of going straight up. And you can see these ones at low levels are a lot more exciting to me than those that have already taken off like this one. And I think that these ones that are at low levels have the potential to, to take off and trade higher. So anyway, that's the... Um, that's some China stocks in here. I haven't cleaned the list up, so I don't know if, if they were all pure China stocks. They probably needed a little uh, cleaning up. But for the most part, most of these, at least in here, are China. And this, look at this dang stock. Uh, not too exciting just yet, but it is kind of bottoming out, as you can see. So that's the point I want to make. I don't want to bore you and go through all of these one by one. But there's uh, quite a few of them in here looking interesting and heading higher. Some are a little wide and loose, and that's okay. But if you look through them, there are some that have nice little structure and have potential. So keep an eye, continue to keep an eye on those China stocks. Let's take a look at the overall market. Okay, we'll get to that, Andre. We'll get to that in a little while. Um, S&P 500, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that it's been kind of sideways in here, okay? Here's the good news, though. It's up about a third of a percent today. Well, woohoo, is that a big deal? No, but look how close it is to all-time highs, okay? It is, in fact, if we close a little bit higher, look at that, less than two-tenths of a percent. I feel like tiny elbows. Look at that. Look at that market. Look at that market. It's huge, okay? It's up. It's less than 2% away from all-time highs. So we could, it, this thing could take a little higher in here, and we could actually see the market at, at, at all-time highs while we're doing this presentation. Now, it's, if it closes there, I'm measuring the close, obviously. If the close is right here. It's just going to get past this little close right there. There it is. And again, you can see now it's a little bit, yeah, it's less than, uh, less than uh, about an AA, was that about an eighth of percent, twelfth of percent away from all-time highs. Now, it's still got to get there, but so far, so good. All right, NASQAQ is, bam, wait for it, at 15-year highs, okay? So that's a good thing. Here's the thing that I've been talking about quite a bit. Every time this market begins to have a little bit of a downtick, last Friday, for instance, the Chicken Littles come out of the woodwork. And I almost did a Chicken Little column. If you've been reading my columns over the last year or two, you'll know that every now and then I'll, I'll roll out the little Chicken Little, the little chicken man in a, in a chicken contest, the little man in a chicken contest. I don't know if he's a little chicken man, but it's a little man in a chicken, co chicken costume. And I'll roll him out, and I'll talk about the Chicken Littles. The sky is falling, okay, like it's the end of the world. Like the market is going to tank, and it's topped, and that's it. You better run for the hills. And then what happens? market goes on to make new highs. Will that always happen? No, of course not. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 
but you want to err on the side of the trend. Everything works better with trends. So if you're trend following and the market is trending, guess what? That's good. If you're trying to catch a tan and the sun is shining, guess what? That's good. So with this, with Dave, how do you err on the side of trend? Well, one of your little rules, one of my unwritten rules, I should say, which should also be your rule, is the fact that if a market is within spitting distance of brand new highs, then err on the side of the trend. That will help save your butt and keep you on the right side of a trend for a long, long time. All right, that's the NASDAQ. We talked about Brazil earlier. You can see it's still a nice little bottom in here. So far, so good. Oh, look at that. Bring it out to new highs today. Okay, that was on my list a couple days ago. Bam, winning China. Eh, down a little bit in here, but so what? Last Friday, right here, I'm giving my speech, and somebody I uh, said, oh, you know, we're, we're buying these China stocks. They're looking pretty good. Somebody interrupts me and says, Dave, did you see China this morning? I'm like, oh, God, well, what happened? Well, it's down 5% overnight. And I'm like, whoa, sh you know, maybe I should quit giving my speech and go check my portfolio. And I, I have to admit, it kind of iced me a little bit. I'm like, well, shit, you know, uh, pardon my French. You know, what, what's going on? And then I, I kind of lost my by um, train of thought, and I'm like kind of freaking out a little bit. So I, I regained composure, and I finished my speech. And when I got done, I popped up my, I opened up my laptop, I booted it up and everything. And guess what? The stock that I was long, JMEI, guess what it did? It was higher, okay? So don't get too caught up in the minutia of it all and say, ooh, China's down overnight, let's freak out. No, just follow the plan. It's all you have to do. I know. Easier said than done. A lot of people have a hard time doing it. Before I forget, take a look at Rusty. Um, Rusty, not too far from all-time high. So far, so good there. What's my rule? Well, with you, if you're within spitting distance and less than a half a percent, that's spitting distance, maybe even one or two percent, okay? Then air on the side of the trend. Energies look fantastic in here. Uh, big bull in energies. Nice bow tie. Look at this little... Uh, I guess you'd call it a triple bottom. Kind of a little wide and loose, but look, they got their act together over here. Nice persistent move higher. You got a bow tie, a little pullback. Ah, you got some bad memories back here, but not too bad, okay? Just a little bit, and I think you could get through it based on the magnitude and the persistency of this trend here. So I'm still a bull on the energies. We're long TGA in the energies, and let's just see what it's doing today. And you can see why we're long. Eh, it's up a little bit, better than the poke of the eye, up 13 cents. But you can see, look at this bow tie right here. That's a beautiful little bow tie. Now, you got some bad memories back here, but that's 100% higher, so so what? If we make it up to here, we've got a decent trade, and it's worth, uh, that's going to be a good problem to have, okay? But again, you got a nice little bottom form. you got a bow tie. you got a little pullback here, and then bam, so far, winning. So energy's looking pretty good. Steel and iron. Still like steel and iron. It's not, it's a little bit more stealthy than the energy. It's not quite as... Um, Blatant, it's more of a saucer type of pattern. Uh, go back and read like Schaubacher, Edwards and McGee, uh, Edwards and McGee, Edwards and McGee, okay? And you can see that, but you still got a bow tie here, and that's coming off of major, major lows. That's always a good pattern. Nice little pullback here, nice little saucerish type of pattern, and so far so good today. So I'm bullish on steel and iron. You know it would be a great trade? How about steel and iron in a Chinese stock? So go look there for some opportunities, okay? Now, some of these areas in here, like drugs, are in longer-term trends. So far, so good. They're not too far from the all-time highs. Again, you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend. Now, not everything is rosy. Retail looks a little bit dubious, but it's having a good day today, okay? Now, again, it's not too, too far away from all-time highs. It's only uh, about a percent and change, whatever, yeah, one three-quarter percent away from all-time highs. Now, you do see these moving averages are beginning to roll over here. So that's a little questionable, but one big up day, you're back to new highs, okay? And then you no longer have to worry about it. Biotech's been crawling back higher, not too far from new highs. Yes, it's got to get there. Yes, it could stall at those old highs, but so far, so good. If you have some biotechs in your portfolio, as you should as a longer-term trend follower, then you just stick with them, okay? Now, I'm not going to go through too many more of these sections. Let me just show you one or two more in here. Uh, semiconductors, uh, they're not that far from new highs. They've been a little bumpy in here, but so far, so good as far as getting back to their old highs or, or, or trying to get back to their old highs, I should say. 
Shorter term, though, a little bit sideways. And again, even though some of these areas like the semis and retail look a little dubious, you don't want to rush out and go short crazy on them just yet because so far the market is doing pretty good, okay? <laughs> look at Sid, copy Brazilian company. Yep, that's one of our stocks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, say what you want. You know, you might not like Brazil, or you might have some things you don't like about Brazil, but this is one of our um, this is one of our stocks. And let's see what's going on. Let's take a look at that real quick. Uh, let's see, Phil and I are often on the same page. Oh, page length, wavelength. <laughs> so, oh wait a minute, I thought that we had that one. Oh well, it's definitely on the list. But yeah, that looks fantastic, Phil. I thought that was uh. I'm, I stand corrected. I thought that was on the list. I've got screen shut down to do this uh, program. But you can see that looks pretty good. It bottomed out in here, kind of made the bow tie, made a little thrust off the low, a little saucer and handle. So, and that's a, um, what is that? Steel and iron, and it's Brazil. So it's got both of the buzzwords working for it, okay? Yeah, I thought it was in the portfolio. I thought I put it in here. Oh, well. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to keep track of everything when you're doing a presentation. You're correct. Okay, Sid is on the list. Okay, good. Yeah, I thought so. I, I'm like, because <laughs> if I did, you know, if it's not, I, I I screwed up. All right, cool. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for individual stocks. We can always come back to sectors or whatever. You have any questions? Um, okay, Andre wants to know about court. Let's pull that up and see. Thank you guys for coming today. By the way. Um, well, this is a stock. What I'm seeing here is it's lost a little bit of momentum. Notice that we've got a line drawn in from weeks past where it kind of went straight up, and now it's kind of going sideways, okay? So it's lost some momentum. So for me to get excited about this stock, it would have to break out of this base and then play the first pullback. Now, if it's on your momentum list, keep it on your momentum list. I'm sure I got it on some momentum list somewhere on my system. But you definitely want to stick uh, with it. Uh, Richard wants to know about UWTI. The problem with this stock is this is an ETN, but it's triple leveraged, okay? So you need to avoid these triple leveraged ETFs like the plague. Instead, go for something like USO, which we're long right now, as you can see. That's in the portfolio, okay? So trade something like, in fact, USO, we're long, okay? So the full disclosure, I might be talking my position here, okay? But you can see, so far, so good. And even at these levels, it still looks like a pretty good trade. I still think it has a long ways to go. Um, you know, write this down. I, I think I think oil prices could double in here easily, okay? So we could see a $30, $40 USO over the next few months. Okay, let's take a look at uh, Tesla. TS, what's it, TSLA? Yeah, if you could give me the symbols on these, um, it makes my job easier. I could find it, though. Tesla, T-E-S-L-A, T-S-L-A. I, although I do know I do know a lot of them uh, from um, looking at them. Okay, kind of interesting. It's bottomed out. It's bow tied, and so far it's breaking out of that bow tie. It's not a setup right now. My only problem with Tesla is when you or it's going to trade a transitional pattern, such as a bow tie, I would rather trade it off of multi-multi-year lows. Now, it's a couple-year lows, so that's not bad, but I like to see super-duper long-term lows. Let's take a look at that EWZ real quick as an example. Notice that it's way, way down here. Let's take a look at like a weekly chart. So this is its lowest level. It's about six-year lows or seven-year lows. Okay, and then before that, you can see it's, it was way down here. All you can go all the way back to like 2005, and that's about where it was. So I'd rather have that kind of pattern than something like Tesla, which is at these higher levels. Now, with that said, let's zoom in a little bit too. It's a little wide and loose in here, kind of all, all all over the place. Easy for me to say. So for me to get excited about Tesla, believe it or not, and this is just me following my methodology. It's not my way, the highway. I would actually like to see this company or this stock 
make brand new highs, and then I would look for a pullback along the way. Okay, Caterpillar probably not going to like it because it's a, a big thick stock. But let's take a look at it. Okay, now the HV is a little bit on the low side, it's at 23. But yeah, not bad. Uh, I'm kind of a bull in heavy equipment stocks right now. Some of these uh, heavy equipment stocks have bottomed out and looking pretty good. So yeah, this is a bow tie. It would have already triggered it here, but you got a little opening gap reversal today. Uh, I would take it as a new trade, see if it could follow through to the upside, and then look to play it on pullbacks. Okay, Andre says, AMPE, how to protect yourself from such falls based on your methodology? Well, first of all, before you even pull it up, it happens. Let's see what happened. Whoa, look at that. Okay. Well, first of all, you take partial profits, okay, and you trail a stop higher. Now, I don't know for a fact, but let's say you traded it from here. You took partial profits somewhere in here. Maybe, just maybe, you got stopped out on a trailing stop before this ever happened. But sooner or later, it will happen. Now, if you're only risking a small amount on a trade, now keep in mind, just because you're risking 2% doesn't mean that you can't have a bigger, you can't get whacked for more. But if you're only risking a small amount on a trade, look at the HV in this thing. Now, I don't know what it was, but it was, uh, let's see if this is the HV down here I have plotted. Uh, I don't know for a fact what it was. I don't know what I have here, if that's the 50-day HV. But I guarantee you this stock had a pretty high HV. So it had high volatility going in. The higher the volatility, the smaller your position size would be. Okay? So if you did take partial profits and then you did get whacked like this overnight, it is what it is. Okay? It happens. And it's going to happen to you sooner or later. And that's just the nature of the beast. We're trying to capture the black swan, like I talked about a few weeks back. And that means these big moves that look like this, but to the upside, that trill that goes up 100% over a couple of weeks, that's the kind of moves we're looking for. But it happens. And what do you do? Well, you dust yourself off, and you get pick yourself up, and you start all over again. Now, sometimes you get lucky. And you have a gap down like this, and then it just gets so overdone that the stock immediately comes back intraday. In that case, you could implement a damage control plan. But, yeah, it happens. You will get whacked at some point in time. That's one of the few things I can guarantee. But if you make enough money on the other stocks and you catch a winner here and there, then it tends to all kind of level out. But, yeah, that's sooner or later it will happen. So there's really nothing you could do to prevent that. You trail your stop higher, and hopefully, you just get stopped out at the at the um, at the the trailing stop. And a lot of times they'll roll over slowly or pull back deeply before they crash like this. Okay. Valero is uh, what's the symbol in that? Velo. These bigger stocks. Yep, there it is. I'm not as familiar with some of these bigger cap stocks than small ones. Now, Valero, even though I'm a bull in energies, Valero is not exactly an energy stock. It's more like a retail slash distributor slash uh, is it a refiner too? Um, higher oil prices aren't necessarily bullish for refineries. I believe that's correct because they have to buy the product to refine the product. I think that's how that works. I'm not an expert on that. I just look at the charts. But looking at this chart, I wouldn't rush out and short it, but if if I had to, I would I think this could be a possible short because it sold off. It kind of looks like a bow tie and it's got a little pullback, kind of an inverted cup and handle type of pattern. So if long or short, I would short this stock. But right now I'm not rushing out to short a whole lot of stocks at this juncture. We're short UAL which I think is in a lot of trouble. Uh, but that's the only stock that's short in the portfolio. I'm not a huge fan of shorting stocks, but I think it it trains you to see both sides of the market, and I think it's a necessary, I hate to say evil, but it's a necessary evil. And it also helps you, with, like you might be bullish on a stock. Let's say you were bullish on Valero. Well, if you've shorted stocks in the past, you'll say, well, wait a minute, that looks like a bow tie, double top, first thrust, inverted cup and handle, all of a sudden, you're recognizing all these patterns, okay? 
that you might not recognize if you're always a bull. People, friends who run these long only funds, um, you know, God bless them for, for what they do, but I find they're always bullish because what else are they going to do? They can only buy stocks. And again, once again, you're handcuffed when you are when you are registered and when you are running money professionally and publicly like that. So, but you know, God bless them because that is not an easy business. I spent uh, about 15 years on that side of the business, and, and I have to tell you, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, VA for Jesse. VA. Uh, no. Okay. Look which way the stock is headed. Draw your lines, okay? It's headed lower. It hasn't bottomed out yet, so I would not um, buy that. It'll not only have the bottom out, but it'll have to begin to rally off of those lows. All right, Heather says EVEP. She says the turnaround with the bow tie off of lows. Well, guess what, Heather? You get the first high five of the morning. That looks beautiful, okay? Now, but Dave, I thought you said you know bottom fish. No, 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 no. No, we're not bottom fishing. What we're doing here is we see a stock that was 70 bucks a share. It's now, what, $17 a share. So I call that my Phoenix strategy. Now, it's just a name for bow ties and first thrusts and things coming off of major lows. Nice little beautiful bow tie coming off of all-time lows, I think, for this stock. Let's double-check that. Okay. So this stock needs to be, yep, yeah, close enough, close enough for government work. Okay, almost all-time lows. And, um, yeah, fantastic. Looks looks uh, looks good. Um, you probably would have triggered in about right here, but it still looks good. Now, I'm not a breakout player, but when they're this low and they begin to break out after that bow tie and all, I think it's worth a shot. So if it gets a little bit higher in here, let's say maybe it takes out this high here, I think it's worth a shot. And you could put a stop somewhere back towards this base just in case you're wrong. It comes back at the base, so what? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. So high five, Miss Heather. Good job on that. Kiwi for Greg, Q-I-W-I. -I. Ooh, that looks good. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Uh, it's a little wide and loose. You're not coming off all-time lows, but close enough. It's bottomed out. Let's take a look. Let's zoom in a little bit see what we got. Um, yeah, it looks okay. It's a little wide and loose, and it's pulled back a little bit, but I certainly could give you an okay on that. Um, yeah, it looks like it's bottomed out. It says financial services. Uh, sometimes these um, stocks get thrown into financial services. Anybody know what they do? QIWI. It'd be good to get the right sector on that one. Oh, you're welcome, um, Freder Frederico. It's the the writing is so small on this. I wish I could make it bigger. I think that's your name. I could. I could it's hard to make out. F X C for John. F X C. Uh, yeah, that looks good too. Okay, this is Canadian. I'm actually bearish on the uh, what is it? U.S. Canadian, Canadian U.S. I forget which one. But yeah, this uh, or bullish on this ETF to make it easier on me. You've got kind of a bow tie-ish looking pattern here. You guys are, you guys, I'm impressed. Okay, you guys have been paying a lot of attention, and, and you do guys, don't worry about it. I'm not going to beat you up too much if if you give me some stocks that are stinkers, uh, but we're going to learn, right? Uh, yeah, kind of a bow tie in here. It's pull back, cup and handle, breaking out. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Now keep in mind, it's got an HV of 12, historical volatility, so it's not going to move much, but it's certainly worth taking a look at it as a possible position. And you might just want to trade the um, the online stock. Russian online payment visa. Okay, that makes sense. QIWI. Anybody remember? Is it RUS? What's the Russian shares? Let me see if we can punch those up just for SNGs. Russian. Oh, there's something in Russia. There's a Russia stock out there, ETF. R-U-S-S-I-A. Uh, here we go. We don't want to do the three-time thing. RSX, that's what I'm looking for. There it is right there. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed recently that these Russian stocks are beginning to kind of get their act together. They don't have a lot of structure to them, but even if you just uh, do something like draw a simple trend line below the lows, you can see that they're they're getting their act together. There's a little overhead supply, but uh, Russia might be the next, um, might be one of these stocks we'll be talking about or one of these countries we'll be talking about soon. Thank you, Greg, too. I appreciate that. Okay, VIP for Dan. Andre, you're next. 
on some of yours. Andre's got a few punched in. Um, it looks okay. It's kind of lost a little steam in here. Uh, if you do your, your line across here, but you can see back here, you had a bow tie, you had a double bottom. It just was really pretty. But the problem, one thing I didn't like about it was, you can see I've got it already drawn in. You've got overhead resistance. And look what it did. It went up, and it sort of stalled out at that overhead resistance. So it's not bad, but it would have to get past that for me to get excited. And unfortunately, when it gets past that, then it's got to deal with this which is a big mound of overhead supply, which no big deal. I mean, if you're up 40% on a stock, that's okay. But to me, I'd rather go after something that has clear air so it can maybe go up 100%, okay? Uh, Andre wants to know about GPIC. GPIC. Uh, no, too thin. Look at this. This is, uh, no, way too thin to trade. It only trades about 15,000 shares. A day now as a private trader again you're not under the microscope of um, a committee you could trade some crazy stocks like this but I'd leave this one alone it's it's just too it's all over the place I mean it's break out to new highs but it's just way too dangerous okay what's a good entry point and stop point for Q high Q I H I Q U um well it's sort of already triggered in here let's back the stock out a little bit. Back to chart out a little bit. You do have some uh, bad memories to deal with. I guess that's an okay problem to have. Um, I think I would wait for a new setup here. I mean, it looks okay. If you're not already long, then let it get past these um, prior highs in here. And then look to maybe play some pullbacks along the way. It looks okay. Uh, but I, I think I'd leave it alone at this juncture. There's, there's too many other good-looking stocks out there to go after that one. SDRL, I like it. That's C-Drill. And it's absolutely beautiful. I'm going to give you a high five. I, I can't show you, but this is on the Landry list for today. I should have uh, – I got to I gotta make sure we don't go on these uh, stocks too much because my people will, uh, will shoot me. But, yeah, it looks fantastic. You got a nice little big old fat double bottom. You got a nice little bow tie. What is it? Oh, it's oil and gas. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. You got a nice little pullback, cup and handily looking or saucer handily looking. Again, bow tie, pullback. That looks fantastic. That's beautiful. Okay. High five. High five. Richard wants to know about hack. Um Pure fund, cybersecurity. Well, it's an ETF. I'm not a huge fan of ETFs. I would find out what's in this ETF that's banging out these new highs, and then I would go after that stock. Uh, but, yeah, on pullbacks, this might be worth a shot. And, I mean, think about it. Um, very interesting. One thing, Ian McActivy, if I could never say his name right, he's, um, uh, he's from Canada. He's in our organization, the Aptim. And uh, he gave a present. He wasn't allowed to fly uh, or couldn't fly for some reasons. And uh, so he had to give his present. Uh, he, was, he wasn't feeling well. It's a long story. Uh, but he wasn't feeling well and, and couldn't fly in to, to, to meet with us. Uh, so he gave his presentation from his home. And uh, one thing that he talked about was the fact that Bloomberg was down like the night before or two nights before, I forget when. And the bond market came to a halt, and there was a bit of a, um, a price shock and some bonds or some things in the system because people had to sell first and ask questions later. And his point was that very, you know, you always get good information out of Ian. And his point was that the Bloomberg is, is the actual market for certain bonds, okay? So it's kind of like an exchange was taken out by a glitch in the Bloomberg system, okay? Now, where I'm going with that is his point was that there's all this focus on, like, Iran trying to build a nuclear weapon and all this. And if somebody really wanted to do some some terrorism, they could take out the Internet, okay, and it would cripple – it could cripple the economy. I mean, there's all kinds of things it could do. So it was a very um, interesting point that he made. So I would think – and I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but I would think something like this hack – there might be something there, but find out what stocks within this hack, and you can find that on the internet. Uh, make up this ETF and and look to those individual stocks. Um, 
For currency traders, it's better to trade the spot Forex and be subject to rollover daily or look to the ETF equivalent. I don't care about the rollover. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you don't catch a trend, the rollover does hurt you. Uh, if you can catch a trend, if you do catch a trend, you can still make a lot of money in Forex position trading. But you have to pick your spots very carefully so that, that uh, what was that ETF we were just looking at? Oh, there it is. Nope. Um, I forget which one it was. Let's see if we'll do this. This little FXC. Yeah. Then trade them off of major, major lows like this so you can possibly catch a big trend coming out. Um, to each your zone, I'm sure the ETF has its own um, tracking issues. Um, but, yeah, if I, you could trade outright Forex and hold positions. But, yeah, the daily tracking, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, the daily uh, rollover uh, could suck. But I guarantee you the daily tracking on something like this is going to give you problems, too. So there's no free lunch, unfortunately. John wants to know about FXC. Sounds like an ETF. Yeah, we talked about that one, I think. Yeah, Canadian dollar. FXB. Okay. FXB. Uh, not quite. The, the pound hadn't bottomed out just yet. Makes me want to look at UUP. Oh, by the way, what did I just say? Where, where do you trade currencies? At the fringe, okay? Look at this bow tie right here. Currencies are a very efficient market. But if you wait until you have some sort of transitional pattern coming off of all-time highs or major highs or at least multi-year highs, ideally all-time highs, but off of multi-year highs, sometimes you can catch a pretty nice little trend. And you get what I call, or what everybody calls, I should say, an inefficient type of move. So, yeah, if you're rolling over contracts in Forex, and it goes from there to there. Uh, yeah, you're going to get some slippage and screwed along the way, but so what? You're going to make so much money, it doesn't matter. Uh, not quite a bottom yet, though. You see, you don't have your bow tie yet. It's just kind of it's kind of bumping along in here. Downtrend still intact, a little early on that one, but, yeah, keep an eye on it. Jesse wants to know about BBG. BBG. BBG looks good. You know, you could throw a dart at these oils for the most part. What was that, XES I said earlier? Uh, this would be a good ETF. I'm not a big fan of ETFs, but this would be a good ETF to get long to give you some exposure to those energy stocks while you're waiting for some more to set up. So, yeah, that stock looks pretty good. Um, in this particular case, though, with this BBG, you do have you do have some issues here above the market. So I think you could do a little bit better with this. I forget what, what Heather said earlier, but the one Heather had I like better than this. It's not bad. It looks like it's bottom, but you're going to have some problems along the way, or likely have some problems, I should say, with this overhead supply. Remember, my form of technical analysis, what we're doing is we're reading the mind of the market, and we're trying to figure out what the other participants have done. And to quote my friend Tom McClellan, those people will screw you. So these people right here who bought, and are still holding on to this stock, they might screw you when you dis when you buy this stock when it rallies up to this level, okay? So never forget there are people behind the bars, and in some cases, just people end up behind bars. Smitty wants to know about CYTR. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, needs a little bit more pullback, though. Um, not quite enough knockout move on that TKO. A little bit more pullback, and I think that certainly would be a viable setup. It does. Um, I don't. I'm not really crazy about them when you got these prior little peaks in here, but that was a, a year or so ago. So I'm going to say yes to Smitty, uh, but it needs a little bit more pullback on that. So I wouldn't go after it just based on the magnitude of the run higher. Nathan wants to know about C J E S C J E S for Mr. Nathan. Absolutely, high five to you, Nathan. Uh, yeah, you got some bad memories, but they're way back here. It's not a whole bunch. You got to look at this pattern here. This thing is bottomed out for months and months and months and months and months. So some of this supply, and you don't know how much. You'll never know. You'll find out once you buy it. But some of this supply has worked its way through the market. But look, oil and gas equipment and services. Big day has been a bull. This whole presentation on oil and gas equipment and services, okay, and energies in general. Yes, you got a bow tie here. Nice little run from lows, nice little pullback, saucer and handle, cup and handle, bow tie again, first thrust. It's got everything, okay? And, Nathan, I'm not just saying that because you're on the service, okay? MDR for Andre, probably not going to like it. A little too big. 
Oh, maybe I changed my mind on that. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, nice little trend, little pullback in here. So far, so good. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Well, you got a lot of bad memories, and I would pass based on these bad memories, okay? Uh, now, whenever I, I go on uh, Doug Newberry's show every now and then, and whenever I say, yeah, it's got bad resistance, it's got resistance up here at uh, whatever, seven, seven bucks a share, it's like, but Dave, that's a 40% move. It's like, well, it's close enough to where it caps my trade, and I want to get into a trade, and I want to have unlimited gains on that trade, okay? Take a look at this uh, CJEE at 14 bucks a share. Uh, this has a little tiny resistance here. But this thing could easily double in value before it starts hit, bumping up against any resistance. So I'd much rather trade for this than trade for a smaller gain that has a closer, shorter-term resistance, okay? Rich wants to know about CVTI. CVTI. Um, it's in a longer-term trend. I'm not a big fan of truckers because they can be a little choppy. It's a little bit on the thin side. It looks okay. Uh, you can see it's kind of choppy in here, but it looks okay. So if it hits new highs, I want to pull back. It would have to make new highs and then pull back, and it might be worth a shot. Now, once I get into stock, I don't mind if they chop sideways and work their way higher. I think, uh, what's, what's the one we're in that's doing that? CTLT maybe or one of those? CTLT. Yeah. You see, notice that it's, it's um, we got in and then it made a base and then it took off and then it made another base and then it took off and now it's making another base. Hopefully rinse and repeat. This type of move is sustainable and it just kind of quietly goes along and does its thing. And nobody really notices. You got something like Trill, it goes straight up. Everybody gets all excited. People start selling because they think it can't go up any higher. Then you get these big, deep corrections. You get something like this, what I call a box stock, kind of like a Darvish-style stock. They just kind of quietly go about their way. Now, I didn't have a setup. This is the only setup that, based on my methodology, was right back here. You could see you had a nice accelerated trend higher. It was an IPO. It pulled back. First pull back an IPO. You also had some IPO breakout stuff going on back here that looked kind of interesting. And again, accelerated trend higher and pullback. So everything worked back here for my methodology, but now it turned into a box stock, which is fine with me. I love when they do that. Okay. Now, I don't trade Darvis style directly, but if I'm in a stock and it turns into a Darvis stock, then by all means, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, Darvis wrote a book, How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market, and... Um, it's a good book to read. It's It's been out for a long time, but I don't think you could trade it directly. But as far as like his mindset of, of doing things, it's it's more of a, a mental mindset as opposed to an exact methodology, the way I see it. But, yeah, if you could figure out how to identify those box stocks, you'd own the world. Um, yeah, we talked about this one already, I think. It's kind of wide and loose. It had to break out the new highs. It didn't pull back for me to get excited about it, okay? No, don't worry about that. Rich said he feels like the move is over. No, don't ever feel like the move is over. Um, let it go, like uh, Frozen. Okay, yeah, John says this parabolic. Yeah, that's a little too much. This is what I call a, if you go in and watch the stock selection, um, uh, I think even the teaser video had it in there, uh, what I call a bottle rocket. Sometimes stocks go up like 100% or more over a short period of time. Uh, I call it a bottle rocket, and in those particular cases, just let them go. Uh, you can't kiss all the women, okay? Yeah, CJES, we talked about this, but it looks good. You got a little, you got a couple overhead supply problems. Not a problem, though, longer term, okay? All right, well, look, uh, we're at about an hour and a half, and that's about when the recording gets a little hard to manage. So I know we got some unanswered questions, but you can always shoot me an email or, of course, bring them to next week's show. I have a blast doing these shows. If you can't tell, I'm, I really do. I have a lot of fun. I'm, I'm honored to have uh, have you guys here. Looks like we had a record crowd today, even with a little glitch on the open. So um, uh, I appreciate that, the glitch on the beginning. Um, again, any unanswered questions, David, DaveLander.com. I hope to see all you guys again next week. If we don't talk again, um, then everybody have a fantastic weekend. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome, Leon. Thank you. You're welcome, Alan. You're welcome, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome, Rich. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.